Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming in to um, the, uh, this webinar um, tonight. Um, we really want to, yeah, thought it was a great idea to have a talk about um, investment um, uh, properties and what's going on in the market at the moment. Um, uh, so I think what we'll do first is just have a quick look around with, with, um, with ourselves and just introduce um, who we are. So um, my name is Brett Davies, I'm a mortgage broker for the Mortgage Lab and have been for um, since the conception almost of the company. Um, and I'm based in Auckland, doing lending all um, around New Zealand. So um, maybe Rupert, we could jump into you and um, yeah, have a chat with you. Yeah, so uh, my name is Rupert Goff. I um, started Mortgage Lab just over five years ago. Uh, I am sort of the founder and CEO of Mortgage Lab. I um, also am the author of The Successful First Home Buyer, uh, and I write some weekly columns for One Roof on uh, various mortgage topics. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's my, <laughs> my experience. <laughs> um... Gareth um, Collar from Epsom Tax. Maybe we could hear a little bit about you. Yeah, sure. EpsomTax.com was founded in 2008. Uh, so I'm the executive director of the uh, of EpsomTax.com group and the principal. We're investment accountants. So we specialize primarily in property, residential property. And that, of course, has several forms. That includes not only a traditional rental, but also things like Airbnb, uh, boarding houses, and then we've also got a you know, share of clients are doing property developments and some in commercial. And in more recent times, of course, there's more and more interest in crypto and NFTs and those sorts of things. So under that banner of investment, we can advise on that too. But of course, tonight, the focus is property. That's right. Um, thank you. Uh, Daniel Chani from Good Life. Yeah, uh, so I'm the owner of Good Life Financial Advice. Um, we've been helping Kiwi mum and dad investors, if you will, for 23 years now to grow and protect their wealth. And um, I guess that's something that we're very, very passionate about is helping people to, in a, in a holistic way, so looking at all areas of their financial life uh, to get them to a place in their, um, at some point in their life where they're financially independent, not reliant on the government or, or an employer or whoever for their income. But that's, a, that's quite a journey. So uh, our job is to help them map that out with the likes of you good gentlemen helping out along the way um, to make sure that debt's st structured correctly, they're in the right investments, um, they've got a plan, um, they're working to that plan, their estate planning sorted, etc, etc, etc. So when we say holistic, we mean holistic. Um, and that's what we do. And that's who I am. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so tonight's really, um, we've broken it down into about three, three main questions around investment lending. Um, uh, hopefully everyone's got the opportunity to or can see that they can ask questions. Please take, take advantage of that um, while we've got some experts here um, um, and just fire those questions through as they come, um, as, you, as you wish. Um, so uh, maybe we'll kick off with um, our, first, um, our first question. Um, so what has changed in the investment property market in the last 12 months? So um, maybe we'll start with you, Rupert, if that's okay. And um, have a chat about what you think. I'm, about. I'm going to try and boil this down to less than an hour and a half because there has been so much. I mean, the, the mortgage world from this time last year is completely different. Uh, we had LVR changes, which affected the investment uh, property buyers down to 60%, you know, maximum borrowing for existing properties and 80% for, for new builds. Uh, but then the real one that everyone will have felt if they didn't even know about it, they, they will have felt it was the Credit Contract and Consumer Finance Act, which came in in the 1st of December, but was actually implemented by the banks uh, a couple of months earlier than that. They wanted to show the Reserve Bank and the regulators that they were being responsible with their lending, so they implemented a lot sooner. Now, that brought in a raft of cha policy changes. In, in the last quarter alone, one of the banks made 38 policy changes to its lending, which is, I mean, usually we get one or two a month. Uh, and so there was just, it, it, you couldn't understate how much it changed the world of lending for investors. Um, but essentially what the triple CFA did was it made 
the uh, directors and the board of any lender personally liable. You couldn't opt out of your liability. You couldn't cover yourself with PI cover. Um, and so if a uh, lender was shown to be um, lending irresponsibly, they were personally responsible. And so this is where you find the difference between, say, the main banks where the level of hierarchy, the number of staff levels between the assessor and the director is probably seven, optimistically, maybe more. Uh, so they have no control over those assessors. So this is why the banks have come down so hard on investors and home buyers. But talking about investors tonight. So um, if you're wondering kind of why, you know, it's not the banks don't want to lend. They they very much do want to lend. Uh, but, you know, it's um, uh, it, they've had to change that. Now, along with that came inflation and therefore interest rate OCR rises and therefore interest rate changes. Uh, so um, the banks, uh, uh, as a result of that, put their servicing rates up, which is the amount that they stress test your mortgage at. And with mortgages, as in investors with multiple properties and multiple banks know, uh, the banks have to test all of your mortgages at that stress rate. And that is around 7.5% at the moment. So they've got, you've got to prove that you can pay off your mortgage at 7.5%, all of your mortgages. So in essence, it is a lot, um, it's, it's a lot more finicky, the world of mortgages, as any mortgage broker will roll their eyes and tell you um, from their, from their stress-induced position. Uh, but uh, what the good side is, is that um, there's a lot, less, a lot less demand in the market. And, uh, and I think Daniel's going to talk about that. Um, but yeah, the, um, essentially the, the key one, if we had to pin down what has changed in the past 12 months in the world of mortgages, was the triple CFA, the Credit Contracts and Consumer Finance Act. That has fundamentally changed how people borrow money. Uh, it's going to change again, fingers crossed, in June, although June is not very far away, it would be fair to say, uh, so maybe July. Uh, but the, the legislation is being pulled back to more like what it was uh, um, what it was prior to 1st of December. You're going to find it getting a little bit easier in the next month or two. Uh, so don't despair if you're uh, looking to buy. It's probably my answer. Yeah. Right. Um, thanks, um, Rupert. So Daniel, we're, you know, from, an, from a financial advisor point of view, you know, where do you see thing, where things have changed um, for your clients or, the, you know, what, 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 what are people asking you that are, that are just, you know, that are they're worried about, I guess, with the, with the changes that have taken place lately? Yeah, um, <clears throat> my answer won't be anywhere near as long as Rupert's one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, <clears throat> from our perspective, um, one major change, which is pretty obvious, but it's the knock-on effect of that, is, um, is interest rate rises, right? Um, but the thing is, we, we've always stress-tested interest rate rises with our clients. It's just interesting that when they're actually here, like they are now, the reality of that has uh, set in. So people are, what we've seen um, over the last 12 months is people becoming a lot more sensitive to, to that bottom line um, because of the higher interest rate environment that we're in. Um, so that's really, and because of the triple CFA as well, those couple of things, people being more sensitive to the bottom line, as in what's it gonna cost me to top up this property? We, <laughs> Gone are the days of positively geared properties. We're, we're well and truly into negatively geared land now. So we've seen a real sensitivity um, crop up, really grow exponentially over the last year in terms of people people's affordability or feeling of affordability of that bottom line. Um, that's, uh, and as well as the, the triple CFA, maybe making borrowing a bit, bit harder to, to attain or the levels harder to attain. It's seen, we've seen a real trend into um, uh, more townhouses, people wanting lower um, borrowing capacity stock. So townhouses, terrace houses, stuff in satellite towns. 
you know, not not in the major centres, um, in, in smaller satellite towns. These so kinds of seen, things. Sorry, Daniel, are we seeing a different type of strategy and a different way of thinking around investment lending um, currently, do you think? Um, I don't know if strategy, different strategy, just just more more of a more sensitivity, more people are, are truly understanding because now it's not a future thing that has to happen in terms of, you know, when, when, if we we're in this kind of inf interest rate environment, you're going to need to fund uh, X amount, okay? But we're in that environment now, <laughs> so when you settle, this is what it's going to be, and it, so people are a lot less, um, you know, uh, keen to to do that. So we're seeing people wanting to, to look for properties that have, have a better yield, a rental yield. So um, so that's been a, 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 a big trend over the last 12 months is, is, is people moving towards, um, so I guess in terms of strategy, it's a higher rental yield strategy is, is becoming the norm. Um, obviously, new build um, property is a lot more um, popular as well, especially in the last 12 months because of... Um, the changes that have come in and the taxation changes which um, i'm sure gareth will talk about so new build property popularity has gone up we're we're always pro new builds but that's that popularity has gone up because of the um you know five-year bright line rather than 10 years the interest deductibility on the debt still being there so um that's that's pushed the popularity of new builds um we've seen prices consistently go up too um, yields haven't followed suit as quickly or as fast, so rental yields haven't tracked the, the 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 price hikes in property. So that bottom line has grown, as we've said, and it's um, caused that greater sensitivity, as I keep saying. So we've seen those prices go up. Rents haven't gone up as quick. It's made the bottom line go up, meaning you've got to fund it more. Um, very recently, we've seen the falling away of FOMO. Um, that's been talked about a lot. Um, what I haven't really seen, though, because I've said that that's been replaced by food. Can you, Daniel, can you just yes. explain those those uh, those Sorry, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. acronyms, yes. whatever you're, you're calling Nick, just for, for all of us that may not understand what you're talking about there? Yeah, sorry, sorry, <laughs> yes. Although that's, a, that's funny. That's one that's been um, thrown around a lot. So FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, we really saw a lot of that last year. That's really died off. But I haven't seen what they said has replaced that, which is FOOP, fear of overpaying. Which I haven't actually seen that, to be honest. Um, uh, more just that, I, I keep coming back to it, more that clients are just sensitive to that bottom line. Not so much, oh, I think I'm paying too much for this. Can we get a bargain? Can we can we negotiate? We're not really seeing that, to be honest. And look, they don't, that's not really, the, the builders don't really do that anyway. Um, so we've, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to where things are going uh, in the further question, but in terms of what we've seen, that's what we've seen um, from our perspective. Yeah, great. Um, Gareth, I mean, from, you know, I'm sure you've seen plenty of changes from a tax point of view with rules that we have to deal with. So what's your take on, on all this? Yes, it, that's true. Uh, there have been an enormous amount of changes to tax policy in the last two years, and that continued to accelerate in the last 12 months. Uh, probably the biggest thing for investors has been the introduction of non-deductible interest. And so if you are buying a rental property now, which is uh, not a new build and it is not rented to a community housing provider, then you can't claim the interest on it. In fact, anything that was bought after March 2021. So that's a significant disincentive. There are still investors that are doing that, but they're a real minority. So what those changes mean is that because new builds, uh, anything which has gained its code of compliance or CCC after 27 March 2020, there's a few other little details there, but broadly speaking, anything after that date is a class as a new build and then it has 100 percent interest deductibility and for 20 years so that uh, that's fantastic for um for tax and it also means in other words it works like it always did in the past it's just that these concessions were removed from just about everything else and the bright line test period is five years so typically if you sell a a, a property uh, at the moment if you bought a property today it's going to be subject to a 10 year bright line test, meaning if you sell it within that 10 years and you 
can't claim an exclusion, you'll be taxed on any profit you make. This is the beauty of new builds is that they have a five year bright line test. And, and often by the time they're built, maybe that, that takes nine months, you uh, could already be then nine months into your five year period there without compromising your 20 year interest deductibility period. So that's sort of been a major change. Uh, perhaps the only other thing that we could, uh, or a couple of things we just comment on is those that are renting existing properties to CHPs or community housing providers, they still can claim 100% interest deductibility. So we don't just mean uh, Kaying Aurora, formerly Housing New Zealand, but there's about 60 odd community housing providers in New Zealand uh, that you can deal with there. So that's something not everybody's necessarily that keen on it, but if you're an existing property owner and, and it's starting to bite you, then it's worth examining that. Things perhaps that we would probably highlight uh, a little bit later in our discussion are things like negative gearing, how does that still work, losses carried forward, offsetting loss from one property against another and so forth. But yeah, really interest deductibility or gradually losing the ability over the, the next four years to claim all of the interest on your existing rental, for some that's a game changer. I just, I just want to jump in there because the, the amount of interest, I think people underestimate how much it is, right? So if we look at a, a $600 a week investment property, which is $30,000-ish of rent, to pay tax on that then all of a sudden is, what are we talking, say $9,000 of tax difference? So that that's a, a remarkable difference, right? It's not a little bit of difference. The, the difference between a new build or after, was it 20th of March or 20th of March 2020 or something like that? 20th, yeah. 20th of March 2020. That, I mean, that that is a huge amount of difference of yearly income uh, for it, just one property, let alone multiple. So I think that's worth highlighting. Mm. And maybe one thing I would just comment is when ring fencing of rental property losses was introduced for the 2020 financial year and the 2021 financial year, at the time it was a, um, a real, the scream moment, you know, oh, oh no. but uh, those that had negatively geared properties and suddenly lost their ability to get a tax refund, i.e. you couldn't offset this negative gearing against your wages. Now you've had a couple of years of carrying forward losses. Well, hello, we get into the 2022 financial year that's just finished in March. Now you've got probably a couple of years of losses to carry forward and offset at the same time that the government is gradually removing the ability to claim interest. So for, uh, we assume most property investors, that pain is delayed, but sooner or later it will bite unless there's some major policy change at a governmental level. Yeah, well, aren't um, National saying that they will be scrapping a few of these things uh, if they get into power next year? Um, so maybe maybe next year there could be a rewinding of some of this stuff. Who knows? But you <laughs> can see why I was saying that clients, clients are sensitive to that bottom line because it's been the perfect storm of these tax changes and rising interest rates. And this has just created a stampede towards needing higher yielding, lower priced properties. Let's and take new this, take this, take this webinar down a political discussion. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I wasn't wanting to do that. Definitely Quick, not. Brett, get us out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Question who? Uh, um, okay. So, right, let's move on. Um, no, no more politics. Um, um, so what do the next 12 months look like for investment in the investment property market? So maybe, um, Daniel, you might be able to kick us off here because, you know, you are really, you're dealing with this type of thing on a daily basis. Um, so, what, I mean, where, where are you? Where are you and what, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, well, next 12 months, similar trend to kind of what I was saying with the last 12 months in my, in my first answer, we're going to see a greater demand for property at that lower price point um, due to the higher interest rate environment that we're in and the effects of the triple CFA on people's borrowing capacities. And hopefully some of that gets rewound as well. Um, but these lower price points attract a, um, a higher rental yield, uh, which is where we're seeing all of the demand 
for a lot of the demand. I can't see that that's going to slow down. Um, people are are absolutely on a hunt for rental yield. Um, so that's that's going to continue as as the next twelve months ticks along for sure. Um, interestingly, we haven't had a, a one client mention their concern around house prices going backwards, even though our good friends in the media talk about that. Um, I, I'm glad that we haven't heard that yet from clients because really, this has been experienced more, I think, across um, uh, you know the major uh, cities and towns in, in New Zealand um, in the in the centres. You know those existing properties in the centre of the cities and towns, um, excluding, of course, Canterbury. Um, they can, they're, they're out on their own there. Um, I can't see a sustained drop in prices continuing. Um, this is merely a, a small correction because we've had those insane hikes for such a long time. So this is, you know, it's not, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's, it's almost impossible that we see that same trend of you know going off the boil um property uh, values i think it's impossible that we'll see that same trend hit new build properties because land values are not going backwards if anything they're going they you know developers are putting land prices up or land prices are going up um and it's not it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see and understand that uh building costs or the materials for buildings, um, for building, are, are going up. They're creeping up because of inflation. So that's pushing those prices up. Um, that's that's irreversible. Um, so I don't see um, prices dipping in relation to new builds. Uh, perhaps the stock won't be flying off the shelves uh, as much as we've seen because of that fear of missing out uh, factor. So that that means less competition, which is a good thing for investors um, or buyers. Um, but as I say, I can't see house prices going backwards for, for new builds. Do you see? Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, do you see more? I think do, I think we will we'll see more turnkey type contracts based on this, right? I mean, surely, you know, because the banks are are not really keen to look at. Um, they want fixed price contracts, right? so yeah. they don't want they don't want to see a whole lot of PC sums or whatever in those contracts. They want to understand that. I've got some certainty in the price that the client's paying for that. So. Yeah, you're right, actually. That's something that I, I, I hadn't thought about, but we are seeing definitely a trend of people um, asking for um, fixed prices or, or even banks even, fixed prices or turnkey contracts. Um, yeah, so, uh, and that makes sense. And I was talking to a builder today. Um, they're not even pricing to put on the market um, some properties in, ver in a very popular area have uh, been very popular with our clients. They're not even going to put them out there to the market yet because they're, they're too, the titles are too far away and they're too nervous to put a dollar figure uh, on the contracts yet. So, um, so you know, uh, hopefully that means that when we do get to that point, that's going to be a fixed price. But we, it's again, that's a, a movement we've seen definitely with the builders where they're chopping out uh, PC sums where they can uh, and making and, and, uh, making these prices um, as fixed as possible. Yeah. So we um, have seen so we have seen some change in bank policy regarding uh, one particular bank regarding um, uh, the, the uh, sorry what's the word that I'm looking for cost overruns. Um, yeah, the cost the, the cost overruns and, and yeah. they've gone up. So you know that adds extra um, extra yeah. um, servicing issues for for lending. Yeah, I just saw that today actually that very subject actually yeah. So yeah. just just. Um, just on another subject, in terms of interest rates, um, I don't, I don't see. Be interesting to see what you gents think about this, but I don't see much more upward movement in interest rates um, because banks have said anyway that they've already largely priced in the OCR um, projections and hikes or to come that haven't happened yet. Um, so they've already priced them in to a large degree. So I'm not too worried about rates going up. Um, much more than where we're at now. They might creep up a bit more, but I don't think we're going to see them go up much more than where we are now. So in terms of the next 12 months, I don't see a huge difference to where we are now in terms of interest rate um, situation. So, yeah, that's my take on what's going to happen mm -hmm. in the next 12 months. What do you think, Rupert? Interest rates? 
I would tend to agree. I think the so the ninety day bill rate, which is what the interest rates for the banks are mainly priced off, have factored in the OCR rates. The OCR will continue to rise unless something really gnarly happens with inflation. Um, you know that that's going to be stable. So I would tend to agree. I think I always use the one year rate because it's the kind of one that everyone follows. It's the cheapest and, and kind of everyone follows that. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a five in front of it, which is kind of half a percent above where it is now, but a, a real low five, right? So so we're not talking that jump that it's done in the past nine months from 2.1 to 4.5. We're not going to see that again. That would be that would be crazy times. So we're, I mean, we're seeing interest rates where they were probably four, was it be four years ago? Would it be about these sort of numbers? And people were happy about it. <laughs> people were yeah. amazed when it got to 4.5. But, but look, the house prices have gone up. So I understand. Yeah. yeah. yeah lots of other changes as well. Uh, um, Rupert, any, what, what about? 12, you know, 12 months in the next 12, investment 12 months, property market? Yeah. 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 Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, the lending is going to get easier, uh, would be my guess. Uh, this uh, the, the legislation um, around the triple CFA is going to get clearer for the banks so that the banks don't have to do things like, and this is the classic one, right? The Kmart's and the avocado on toast. If you've been buying too much at Kmart in the past three months, the banks have always understood that, uh, you know, you, you're going to stop that. You're going to prioritize your investment property or your, your current mortgage over luxury spending when you have to pay your mortgage but at the moment they have to take that into account so um that is going to be redone that you're going to be able to forecast your expenses a lot easier and that is going to bring in a lot more fine it's going to free up the finance which is going to raise demand uh but i think that there's so much at play here right because uh, to, to Daniel's point, you know, th there is going to be, um, and, and Brett's point, there's going to be a lot more turnkey um, contracts out there. This will bring in a different kind of developer. So a, a developer that does turnkey needs to fund the whole development. If it's a $10 million land and build, they need to fund $10 million plus of interest to, to build it all, whereas a progress payment one they just need to fund the section then the customer takes a section and they just have to fund whatever stage of the build they're at it's going to be quite a different developer world um but in terms of uh, of how that affects you as an investment property buyer probably minimally you're just going to see some shift in that market but the good news is that that lending will i think imminently change for the better uh when that demand kicks in the Reserve Bank's going to try and stop properties going on a runaway tear again. They don't want to see another 30%. Nobody wants to see another 30% rise. Um, so uh, that could be, and uh, I am not going to put a large amount of money on this, but that could be in the form of LVR changes, and it will be to investors, uh, would be my guess, because no government uh, coming into a... Um, election year wants to look like they are hurting first-home buyers so i wouldn't be surprised if either they took away the exemption rule the lvr exemption rule from new builds down to 60 percent or made that 50 percent um uh, as a rule so it's not currently that remember it's 60 percent for existing 80 percent actually it can go way higher for um investment property we've seen 90 percent for investment property new builds just watch them playing with that because they don't want to play with the triple CFA. That's a terrible tool to to, um, uh, to stop borrowing. Uh, DTIs, I think they're a terrible rule again, uh, but also, uh, but, and so LVR are kind of their thing. That would be my um, prediction. Yeah, well, we've seen some DTI reversal, right? So um, already this week. So that's not so much of an issue at the moment. For us. Yeah, only one bank has it now, and it's kind of a, a real kind of background policy. It's more of a filter than a policy, really. Um, yeah. So just just to explain that, uh, DTI is what? 
The good point is I've done my it's own game hit hate. Uh, you know, <laughs> ditch, ditch to income ratio. So you uh, uh, typically, you know, they might say you can only borrow seven times your income. If you earn a hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand is your maximum borrowing. It's a I could go on for about an hour on why it's a very stupid rule. It involves student loans, involves interest-free loans. Just don't get me started. But uh, it is a tool that the Reserve Bank were investigating. LVRs are a much more efficient way of controlling the heat of the market. So, so um, Rupert, do you think, in your humble opinion, that they're less likely to use the DTI stick, but more the LVR stick, you think? Because I... I see I haven't seen them talk. Well, I've seen them saying that they could bring in stricter DTIs um, or, or enforce them. Um, so, do you think there's more a higher probability about messing around with LBRs again? Well, I think they're going to try with DTIs. I would, I would strongly back a move against it because they are. I mean, think about a a doctor, right? A a doctor would have a two hundred thousand dollars student loan. Uh, so that takes off, and yet they've got potential earning, large potential earnings, right? But may not be earning so much. They're a brilliant candidate, uh, but their their student loan is stopping them from getting the mortgage they rightly deserve on their income. So, yeah, I, I believe they're going to try it, uh, and I believe it won't work. Uh, so. yeah. All right. Uh, Hopefully, you know, there might be some doctors watching this evening that just suddenly got concerned about that and. <laughs> they could Mine spread out. through the medical community <laughs> like wildfire. Yeah. Uh, well, Gareth, do you want to take us through to the, the end of this question regarding what the next five months look like? I mean, you know, for you, do you see anything significant from your perspective? Yeah. Well, as Groucho Marx says, I'd like to take up the tanks. Uh, Actually, I'd like to take up the carpet, but you have to take up the tax before you can take up the carpet. Uh, so <laughs> that's, um, yeah, <laughs> I love the Marx Brothers. So you're talking about taxes, how will it inf affect investors? Um, at least what we're seeing is that most people have got some losses because a lot of property was negatively geared historically. And not, what I mean by that is it would, it was designed to run at a loss. The income was less than the expenses the loss would generate a tax refund and since so it's been taken away over the last two years these losses they're not lost you know you don't lose the loss it gets carried forward to the subsequent year and so on until you've got some more rental income to offset it against so that means the impact for most people will be delayed uh, somewhat uh, the uh, interest deduction changes kicked in for FY22. So it's the financial year, uh, 2022 financial year, which just finished about six weeks ago. So from October last year onwards, you could only claim about 25%. Uh, you could only claim 75% of your interest on your mortgage. So effectively a 12.5% haircut on the interest for the last year. And then the same 75% uh, uh, effect is, is going to carry right through this year. And then once you get on to the next financial year, so that starts April next year, it's going to increase. You can only claim 50% of the interest in the following year, only 25%. And in the following year, zero. You know, and so some of us know what it's like to have a very severe haircut. <laughs> it's not pleasant. Yeah, although it is quicker. Um, there's less air resistance. So in this case, though, there's not a lot of you know real benefits for investors they just see the value of that being watered down so the question is should you sell your existing property and the answer is it's not a simple answer to that in terms of what the next 12 months should look like i.e a couple of scenarios if you've got some losses in your portfolio from past years you can offset those we'd say at the very least wait till you've used up the losses uh, you need to consider would the investment property be caught by bright line but if you waited another year, yeah, you might have to pay a couple of grand tax, but it means you might sell the property, make a quarter of a million dollars, tax-free capital gain. So uh, there's, that's a pretty good investment if, if that's, that's the outcome. Uh, we've seen probably in the last two years an increase in clients that are selling properties. Most of those, though, are, have sold those to buy a new build, which is 
what the government policies were uh, encouraged to do, were trying to encourage anyway. Uh, the other thing too, though, is given the interest, the uh, the changes that Rupert was commenting on earlier, investors need to just take care a little bit because you might think, oh, well, we'll sell our property and we'll cash up and we'll pay a bit off our mortgage grant and then we'll just buy another one and rinse and repeat. Great. But your borrowing capacity is probably likely very much reduced from what you could do five years ago. So this idea of, oh, we'll do this and that and sounds good in theory but in practice it might not be so it's essential to first check well uh these other tax issues we just mentioned are any bright line issues etc the borrowing capacity i talk to your your mortgage advisor your financial advisor about, about that you know, like the mortgage lab of course uh and just make sure that this this idea this brilliant idea you have in your mind is actually going to be achievable or are you going to need to pull pull that back a bit and then the other thing to consider is, look, if you had $100,000 in the bank, what would you get on it in interest and in term deposit? Something miserable. Uh, even uh, as, a, as a point of comparison, I bought $500 worth of Tezos, which is a cryptocurrency, a few months back. Well, because of what's happened in the share market, that Tezos is $320 bucks worth now. And I looked at the returns on it. Has, if it stays at $500, well, maybe you'll get four and a half, five percent return. That's better than the money in the bank. But it's dropped <laughs> and probably it will recover. And we're talking, you know, a long term strategy. But the point in mentioning these things is sometimes it might end up that you, yeah, you start to pay a bit of tax on your property because you've used up all your losses or, or however it's structured. But if that costs you $50 a week or $100 a week, what would you get with that same money in the bank in term investment in crypto, even in shares? Probably not as good a return. So sometimes you just have to suck it up, hold it for another year or two, the, you know, wait till things just pick up a bit, then think about selling it rather than just rushing in and trying to cash up. So it is very much proceed, proceed with caution. And every situation is different. So what your friend did at work, you know, or what your neighbor did, that doesn't mean that it's going to work for you because there's no end of armchair experts, usually friends who have well-meaning advice. Oh, you should do this, you know, but do they have any experience? Do they have any qualifications? Are they dealing with this every day or are they just another armchair expert? And the fact is all of us, we carry things like PI insurance, which was mentioned before, professional indemnity insurance, because there's comeback on the advice we give. But you mate, as much as they love you, there's no comeback. <laughs> you just maybe uh, might not talk to them for a while. Yeah, because you took their advice and lost 100 grand. So the, the point of that long ramble is, yeah, every situation is different. Don't rush in. Make sure you get qualified advice from the sort of people that are in this webinar this evening. It's um, it's property is always a long term game, right? That's, that's really what it comes down to. At the end of the very day, much, very we've much. We've got to so. ride out. At the moment, we're going through this bit of drama. You know, a year or two back, we were everything was very nice. Interest rates were low, prices were rising. It was great, but we just kept just it's a cyclic thing that we go through, right? And this is just. This is the down. But, um, to, to borrow a crypto expression, hodl, hold on for dear life. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, Rupert, have we got um, by chance anyone just asked us? Oh, we haven't had, any, haven't had any questions come through yet. So, uh, yeah. Well, we, can uh, I? Yeah. We've covered everything. Respectfully <laughs> ask anybody who's out there what they look, they've got anything they want to know. There's no silly questions. Please just ask us. We've got we've got a whole bunch of people here that are, know what they're talking about. So um, please just type away and, and ask something. Um, okay, so let's motor on. Um, anything comes through, Rupert, I'm sure you'll stop I'll us to. Yeah. Okay, so the last um, question that we've got here is um, what, sh um, what should be considered when buying an investment property at the moment? um it's really um who wants to jump in here <laughs> should have a <laughs> could, could i talk a little bit about structure perhaps 
Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Rupert and I were actually talking a while ago about, you know, there was a time when you could probably do your, uh, maybe your, your sole trader rental, um, follow the ID books and, and get it probably mostly right. Uh, what's happened though is with the complexity of laws, timing of code of compliance, uh, interest that is deductible from certain points of view and don't even go down like if you're trying to do some sort of um, development that's a, another world of of technical pain getting everything in the right place has meant a lot of internal education for our firm and and our people are doing this stuff you know, all day every day uh, i've looked at the new tax returns for the 2022 year uh, started working on you know, filing some of those myself and especially for trusts it's just got very very complex and um, so that sort of side of it that's got a lot harder and ensuring you don't end up with some kind of stupid mistake because you i say stupid innocent perhaps but the, the law doesn't allow for innocence or for, for, for good intentions you got it wrong too bad that's that's just how the law is most of the time so we think it's got a lot more uh, risky. And look, this is somewhat self-serving. It sounds like coming from me, hey, we've well, got a lot more risky. You should get an account into your accounts. Uh, so it would be good to hear the comments of, uh, yeah, you know, of Rupert and Daniel on this. But the risk level has certainly increased because the complexity has increased uh, tenfold. It's, I've never seen this level of complexity in, in all the years we've been doing rental or residential property tax so i think that's kind of the one of the first things is yeah it, educate yourself as much if you want to buy an investment property absolutely you know uh, get the uh, new zealand property investor magazine look at joining groups uh, uh, that uh, like the Auckland property investors association obviously follow uh, mortgage lab good life epsomtax.com on social media all that stuff that'll all help educate yourself but probably the days of DIY uh, rental investment are gone. Yep, I would agree. I um, I think the, as as we spoke about before, the the cost of doing a mistake. So in, in the oldie days, you might have claimed some petrol and you shouldn't have claimed some petrol, and that mistake cost you a couple of hundred dollars. Whereas I think now we're into the big numbers when you make a mistake, and that's uh, yeah something worth thinking about. Do you want me to go, Brett, MC, Brett? Can I, can I just no, go, Daniel? I'm no, I'm not going to ask. Well, I am going to ask a question. I, I just had a, a, a lovely, loyal, long-term client of mine text me, actually. I have my phone here, just in case. Um, and he's saying he can't ask questions on the webinar. He can only see a screen with the four of us. So is there a special way to ask the question? Uh, or can that maybe just oh. be emailed? We why, don't we, why don't we come back to an email? <laughs> we'll email it. I may not have turned it on. <laughs> oh, okay. Good times. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Can um, well, I think we can I just jump in here? Um, well, um, okay. No, I'll come back to the genuine go if you like. Um, I just need to come find a solution. So, sorry to say that again. That's right. I'm mumbling. You, you go, uh, Daniel. Tell us about. Uh, Daniel. So, so, uh, so what to consider? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, so, um, well, there's, yeah, I, I say this quite often to people. <laughs> um, you know, there's a saying. Uh, well, you could say, when is the right time to buy an investment property? Um, and my response to that is always now, <laughs> right now. Now is always the right time to buy an investment property. Whether that now was two weeks ago, whether it's um, tomorrow, whether it's in a year, um, the main thing isn't about timing the market, it's time in the market. So really what clients should be, what people should be thinking about is getting advice actually. <laughs> um, get, getting quality advice from the right people, understanding the structures, um, and that structures around the, the, the debt structures, um, their cash flows, um, the risks, the um, investment property structures, um, best and worst case modeling, all that stuff. 
figure all that stuff out. Um, and then if it works and if it's the, if it if it's works for you at that moment, then then get in, set and forget and hold and and um, and hold that for the long term. As we've talked about, I think we all we're all kind of on the same page. There, we're not here to be speculative um, with our clients. We're looking to to grow uh, long term wealth across multiple asset classes, but. Property has been the rock star um, over the years for, for for many reasons. So, you know, it's a 10 year plus recommendation, get in, set it up correctly, get the right advice at the front end to find and analyze that property and the right advice at the back end um, to look after it. And mainly that's your, your Gareth's of this world and property managers, and you just get on with your life. Um, so, you know, we, we did a, we did a, um, a video about this, I think, once before, Gareth, in terms of, you know, it, it doesn't matter what events are playing out at any given moment, you know, and this is the, we spend a lot of time talking to clients about this, removing the emotion from the mix, um, being as unemotional as possible um, with this process. So it doesn't matter. I mean, of course, these are not great things that are happening, whether that's high inflation, rising interest rates, a war in Ukraine, whatever. Any, anything can be played. Uh, the, the Herald just said that uh, house prices in my neighborhood have gone down 20%. Who cares? <laughs> it doesn't matter about that stuff. Um, we're not we're not investing for those reasons. We're investing for beyond those reasons. And historically, you look at any major um, events that have happened, they happen, and then there's corrections that happen after that, um, you know, in terms of upward corrections. So what we're mainly concerned with is can you do it now and can you stay the course in a best and worst case scenario so that's risk management that's risk mitigation that's stress testing fully understanding everything and hitting the go button getting and getting that right advice and um so we want to stress that to people uh, to get the right advice understand the what they're getting themselves into understand the risks understand how to mitigate them and manage them um understand how to not leave thousands of dollars sitting on the table that you didn't even know was there. DIY, um, Kiwi way of doing things. Um, it's, I think we talked about that once, Rupert, as well. You know, long gone is, is, is this space being, being favorable to DIYers. You really need to be in with, with um, really a network of people who know what they're doing. Um, and that's not saying that to sell what it is that we do here. It's just the, there are huge mistakes that can happen. And I've seen them so, so, so often uh, over the years with people before they've come to become our clients. Um, but importantly, you know, having this all um, in the context of a, of a proper strategy, you're not just blindly going out there and buying an investment property. You understand what it means to your financial position uh, now and into the future into your long-term goal of, of where do I need to get to, to be financially independent? Like what's my target and what's this doing to help me get there? Um, so you're putting the, you're putting property into the context of an actual plan and strategy. So in short, um, yes, it is always um, a very important consideration to be buying residential investment property. If you can do it, um, get in, stay in, um, set and forget. Um, and hopefully it's been loud and clear from this uh, webinar to, to, to do it the right way and get advice from the right people. Thanks, um, okay, okay. So we've had a bit of a drama tonight. We've um, obviously got... Um, the a least of all the dramas. <laughs> okay, so here's, um, if anyone's got any questions, we've got a, you know, 10, 20 minutes, whatever, um, to go. We can hang in here for as long as you like. Um, Brett D at mortgagelab.co.nz. If anyone wants to email me something, so that's B-R-E-T-T-D at M-O-R-T-G-A-G-E-L-A-B.co.nz. Um, I do have someone who has actually emailed, um, by the looks of it, both of us, Rupert. Uh, this is for you, um, Gareth, I believe. Um, last year, I remember hearing that IRD was going to change the rules so that uh, if we move a property from personal ownership to a company, it wouldn't reset the bright line uh, tenure uh, do you know if that rule change was implemented? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Um, 
Thank you, caller. I've always wanted to say that. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yes, the law change was debated and passed at the end of March, and it took effect from 1 April this year. It's called rollover relief, that legislation. It doesn't allow uh, changes in all directions and with all entities, but quite often changes that involve moving from uh, trust to personal names or LTC even um, to personal names, uh, there is... Uh, also some comments about uh, movements between LTCs and trusts. So there, there, there's some particular hoops to jump through uh, to make sure that you don't get caught. So that's where the, the devil's in the detail, like uh, in a lot of things. For example, if you're transitioning a property from your personal name into a trust, uh, and then you have to be a settler and the beneficiaries have to be within I think it's five degrees or four degrees and yeah there's various things like that so it's one where time has to be taken to make sure all I's are dotted and all T's are crossed rather than all I's crossed and T's dotted so um, that's one thing the the other thing to consider is at the moment and they've got to fix the law and they've said they will uh, if you had a property say that was bought in 2016 you transferred it into another entity and using this rollover relief, it would actually be subject to 10 year bright line, technically speaking. Uh, and, and that was not the intent of the legislation. So that would mean um, there's no reset of the bright line test, but a 10 year test applies. Now IDF said they're aware of this glitch. It wasn't intended they will fix it at the next time that legislation is passed and it's likely to be august but in a couple of these situations here yeah, we're sort of saying it ain't happened yet they've said they'll fix it but maybe it's better to wait until then so it does depend on the timing of when the property when when an interest was originally acquired in the time in the property that's that's a factor so there's just a little gotcha about that as well and look this is what's happened over the last several years to be honest uh, i guess parliament has said to iid we want this make it happen make it so uh, and so it's sort of in a very star trek way they've had to kind of rush through stuff to try and meet political deadlines i guess and stuff gets broken you know or things are not properly written or there's unintended consequences it happened time and time again because of these tight time frames so i'm not sort of saying oh idea evil here that's just probably a consequence of the pressure that they've been put under to try and produce the goods in the desired time frames so short answer yes long answer proceed with extreme caution thanks gareth um so i've got something else left um um, thanks, uh, Gareth, uh, listening in. Um, this is your question. Um, if you, uh, oh, sorry, understand interest expenses uh, remains tax deductible for 20 years and is transferable to new owners, what is the law around the five year bright line? Sorry, what is the law around the five year bright line? Is that only for, um, for first purchase of post CCC or can it be transferred? That was a mouthful um did you get that do you want me to read it again so, so so the question is um the first purchaser gets a five-year bright line what does a subsequent purchaser get essentially yep. do they also get yeah. five year if, bright if line? they sold it after six years they would still be tax deductible because within that 20-year period would they still have the five-year bright line mm. um my understanding is yes but actually that that hasn't that hasn't come up so i better double check that question i i believe the answer is yes but i'll have to double check that that one uh, it's probably um, worth noting that there's uh as with any new law and we saw this when ltcs were introduced the you know, look through companies were introduced they were not a thing and then they uh, suddenly came in there was lots of stuff that oh hey nobody thought of that ID didn't know so there is sort of a lot of these kinds of questions being asked that uh, we're still having to finalize or find the answer to and I guess just 
why? Well, the the most recent document was 216 pages of single spaced information. So <laughs> it takes a while to read through and uh, and get all the details of, of that. Uh, but that's a good um, question. I will just look um, for a bit of clarity and we'll post something on social media about it. Um, that's okay, um, Gareth. Oh, this is uh, Phil uh, asked that question, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna email you that um, so you can uh, respond if you like, Yeah. Uh, as well as put it where you like. Um, so um, interestingly, I've got some more questions. So thanks everybody for uh, emailing me. Uh, Brett D at mortgagelab.co.nz. Thank you, Rupert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did wonder why two hundred people weren't asking any questions. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Sure, we can review that. <laughs> uh, Daniel mentioned uh, that investors should have a network of people who can provide professional advice. My question is, who should um, you have on your bus? Accountant, financial advisor, mortgage broker. Who else? And how to find them? Really good question actually the question for me Go on, was yeah. It? yeah well i think it's um pretty general i mean oh, sorry. i thought you said daniel oh i um, didn't say daniel because you know well i mean you know you're, you're not reading out the full names and addresses of the people writing in to, for these no, <laughs> questions are you that's uh, privacy first name, uh, first name only yeah. this is um this is trent um but the thing oh. is is that you are a financial advisor um so you know and specialize in this in the series um, so yeah so so um a while ago i, I, I it was kevin smee and i'm pretty sure it was in the herald it was he actually had a very good analogy for it he likened your um well you could say oh, sorry rupert i thought you were laughing at me um he he likened your <laughs> your network to to like a board of directors right um for for your family business right um and that's, as you say, that's a, it's a good accountant, a good lawyer. You notice I say the word good, <laughs> good accountant, good lawyer, financial advisor, investment specialist, um, someone, a good mortgage broker, a good risk specialist, insurance person. Um, and if you're investment property, a good um, property manager as well. I'm trying to think if I've missed anybody out. Maybe a good cash flow management person too, a la... Uh, Linda Moore, money mentalist type person as well. If you really wanted to have the the you know uh, greatest board of directors around you, um, the dream team. The dream team, yeah. So, look, just putting my two cents in here. If it's an accountant, make sure they're an investment specialist. And if it and you know if you're in the investment property space, they're an investment property specialist accountant. I'll stop myself there. <laughs> if they're a lawyer, they're a good communicator. You know, um, what I mean by that is, you know, contracts aren't perfect. Um, and, and sometimes they are written in the favor of the builder, maybe. Just because that's a, a fact, it doesn't mean it's World War Three. It's not a um, an ego competition. It's a let's get to a, a position of, um, of uh, middle ground that everyone can live with. So a lawyer that can help that process along is, is worth their weight in gold, I think. Um, a good property manager who knows the market, um, knows the, 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 the right rents to be um, uh, advertising and achieving, not overstating rents or understating rents. Um, that's important as well. And mortgage brokers, you know, like, I don't know if, that, uh, if you like being called a mortgage broker or mortgage advisor or mortgage specialist, but... Um, you know, someone that knows how to structure the debts correctly, interest only versus principal and interest. That's really, really important because all of these people work in harmony with each other. And like a financial advisor as well, uh, you know, giving investment advice. Um, it, it all works in harmony. What debt to be paying off in the right order. Um, so I think not only is it not only is it good having the right people around you, but the people who are around you um click with each other as well <laughs> they know and respect well they don't necessarily know each other but they respect each other they're not butting heads um and they their their um advice gels with with each other and basically to sum it up they're all there to grow and protect your the client's wealth they are all there to do their part to grow and protect your wealth um and they should all be working in harmony 
to do so, not fighting amongst each other to do so. So that's my two cents about having the right network around you or the right board of directors for your family um, business. Well said. Okay. Um, I just got um, another question. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be two, these two parts this. Um, thank you. Uh, I think it's from Min Lee. Um, what are the benefits of owning a property in a LTC trust or company these days as it seems to be getting more complex uh, compared to uh, in your own name? So that's the first, first question, Gareth, I think, um, you muzzle. <laughs> love it. I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah. That, okay. They are good questions. Okay. So maybe let's just talk about um, tax minimization and a little bit on risk minimization as well. So uh, in terms of maybe why you might use a trust, um, trusts are a very flexible entity. They can distribute income out to the beneficiaries. And that's fantastic in terms of if there are beneficiaries that are on a lower tax rate. Uh, you can't distribute much to your children, only about $1,000, uh, and then they get taxed at the 33 cent rate anyway. Um, so that is if they're minor children. So that's kind of if you've got a, a cash flow positive rental property, in other words, it's making money, and you do have beneficiaries uh, that might be uh, a spouse that's on a lower income, then there are some tax advantages to be attained from distributing income to them. No questions asked, although IRD is wanting to know more about it. They have attempted in the past to uh, argue that the trustee's decision to distribute money to beneficiaries is sort of borderline tax avoidance and that's been struck down in the courts. Why some choose to also use a trust, this is more a lawyer discussion, is because it takes property out of your personal hands. When you own it yourself, when you hold the shares in a company, whether it's a standard company or a look-through company, you own it yourself. So therefore, it is exposed to a certain degree. Any sort of attempt to uh, separate guarantees by banks, as soon as you sign a personal guarantee, forget it. Everything you've got, almost including grandma, is now the banks. So uh, that's sort of one thing that sets trusts apart from other entities. Uh, standard companies, i.e. they're not looked through, just a limited liability company. It, look, if if there's two people buying a property and they're both on the 33 or the 39 cent tax rate, let's say it's cash flow positive, so it's making money, it might be worth putting it in a limited liability company and it pays tax at a flat 28 cents in the dollar. So now you've got a 5% saving or even more if your uh, salary is 180K plus a year. So that's a scenario where that can be useful. Look through companies. Well, look through companies function pretty much the same as a partnership at tax time, uh, and the income or losses are distributed out according to how many shares you hold. One scenario where a look through company is still useful is this you own your own home, there's still a mortgage on it, and your rental property is negatively geared. In other words, you have to top it up a bit each week with cash. Well, what that means is you're effectively lending money as shareholders to your look-through company. Now, over the years, that can add up. Let's say five years go past, you've lent, I don't know, $50,000 to the, to the look-through company. Well, now that company, in effect, can go to the bank five years later and say, I need to repay the shareholders. The value of my rental has gone up. Can I have $50,000? The uh, bank will then uh, lend that money. Assuming it's a new build, this is going to be tax deductible. Because all you're doing actually is switching borrowing from one lender, the shareholders, to another, the bank. It's not new lending. You take that money and you pay it off your own mortgage uh, on your residence. So in that scenario, what you've kind of done is your overall debt stays the same, but you've dropped the debt on your home by 50 grand, increased the debt on your rental by 50, and you can claim that interest. So knock down bad debt, increase good debt. You can do that with a look-through company. You can't do it with a partnership. You can't do that if you buy it in your own name. So we don't automatically say, or oh, thou shalt set up a look-through company. There's specific scenarios where it's worth doing that. Uh, there's other scenarios where just keeping it simple is better. And lastly, if you're a single person, then nine times out of 10, you are better to just buy it in your own name as what ID would call a sole trader. Great, um, thank you. I uh, hope that answers that question for you, um, Lee. 
Um, what um, second one is um, uh, what's have your client um, clients experience been in renting to social housing? It, um, I do have um, some clients in this situation. Um, you so got one, Brett. Generally, there are some benefits from uh, that. You know the, uh, the the people who are leasing the, the building are going to repair the building um, at their cost. Um, so there's some benefits there. So there's no cost to the client uh, if that is built into the contract. <clears throat> um, Daniel, have you had any experience there? We ha we haven't got a lot of clients that have gone down that track. We do have one who has leased theirs to the Salvation Army in Hamilton. Um, yeah, same, same. I had the same thing. Yeah, yeah I've had, I haven't had heard any um, issues whatsoever. In fact, I heard that there were a lot of um, empty rooms <laughs> in the property. Yet they still had to pay the full rent. Uh, and as you said, they'll they'll um, cover any. Um, they'll cover any uh, costs uh, whatsoever um so it's it's you know there's no property management um there's no real maintenance uh charges um guaranteed rent yes well, yeah guaranteed for, rent. For, for the contracted term um you know it might be a five-year term in there or whatever um so there are some i guess there yeah, are some you know. there's look there's some um you know gareth gareth knows these these companies only too well as well. There's some really well-run private companies out there, not poo-pooing clay and aura, but there's some well-run private companies out there that um, you could talk to, um, to, to to pick their brains about uh, if, if, if you, if you want to look at that as an option and if it's a consideration for getting the tax deductibility especially. Um, you know, they're, they're good people to talk to and, and they're private businesses. Um, so they're, you know, um, read, between, <laughs> read between the lines. Um, yeah. Gareth, have you got clients in this situation? Yeah, we do. Uh, the, the, the experiences with community housing providers or CHIPS generally tend to be good. Um, the experiences with Kainga Aura uh, can be like any government department. The wheels turn slowly. Uh, so um, they're not uh, alone in that and we the feedback we've had has been consistently good in dealing with community housing providers unfortunately we haven't been able to say the same with those who've dealt with Kainga Aura so you do just need to really go in with your eyes open if you decide directly to engage with with uh, that government department uh, and the from what we hear it may be less stressful to engage with a community housing provider. As you can tell, I'm just trying to be tactful there and, and apologies Such to anybody at, <laughs> that was at that kind of aura. We know you're you're public servants and know that working hard for the for the good of the people. Okay. Um, I'm gonna slowly wrap this up. So let's have a bit of a recap. <clears throat> um, I think we've come to the conclusion though that investment lending is still an option, right? There's no doubt about it. Um, and we're doing plenty of it still. Um, I know personally that I have many, many clients who are investment, um, in, um, investing in property um, and continue to inquire about that. Um, and I know Daniel, you're the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you think? I mean, you know, from what you hear yeah, okay, and the one roof side of things and all that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that you need to keep up to date with i think the clear indication from this webinar was you know new build is is the way is the direction to look you're going to want to think about cash yield um have a have a think about you know how the banks treat individual parts of the um of the property you're buying so how they scale rent uh, you know how they scale the income uh, because it's a newer property uh, have a think about all those things but in at the end of the day, there is less demand, so there are bargains out there. Um, there are some developers who are having people not settle, so there is actually bargains out there now um, for people that signed up at 18 months ago and now don't fall under the lending criteria. It's worth 
shopping around, I think, would be my reply. Um, we do have to be mindful in that situation for on, with on-selling as far as the banks see um, new builds as an on-sell. It wouldn't be classed uh, as a new because you're not you're not buying it off the developer. You'd have to buy it. Have they would have to fail the transaction, give it back to the developer. Developer sure. then sells it. Mm. Yeah, that's a great great point to make, mate. Mm. Um, quick uh, quick wrap up for you, Gareth. Yeah, it, it, actually, just a thought there on that new build. Um, conceivably if it's being bought within 12 months of the code of compliance being issued you might still be able to jump through a hoop and that, that's i haven't come across any of those situations but again a lot of these that you're talking about hypothetically you know if it falls over and these some of these things you've it, got to kind of the, check out the detail the lvr exemption from the bank it needs to be yeah. from the oh yeah i'm thinking tax of course yeah <laughs> you I know you like were. Yeah. Borrowing, that's not our problem. Yeah. yeah. The Reserve <laughs> Bank the is, is within, I know, I wish they'd uniformed all this, but within six months of the CCC directly from the developer. Wow. Interesting. Okay. I think this underscores that point alone why you need a, a good team around you, not all in each other's pockets. Like we quite often work together, we don't always agree with each other. We're, you know, we're able to disagree about things because the client's at the center. So, mm-hmm. I think that's that's the thing. Uh, it it does sort of unnerve me a little bit. Where oh, oh, come to us, we'll do everything. It's all under one banner. Well, where's your accountability and who's keeping each other honest? You know, so um, that's sort of I think the thing when you when you pick your team, as Daniel had outlined before. Uh, and my only other comment would be, watch out for paralysis by analysis. It's an ongoing problem where people just they don't do anything because they they overanalyze there's a balance to be attained between being informed and and just stalling and we had one set of clients years past four years finally they got into something had they gone with the recommended financial advisor who happened to be good life advice they would have been four years ahead in that whole property market it was just we're happy they finally got something it was just tragic it was just an unnecessary waste and stress in four years so um there are times to diy great you know yeah i'm digging out fence posts at the moment at home but the builder's going to finish off the job so know when to get the builder in okay uh thank you uh gareth i'm sorry um daniel uh any final words of wisdom for you from you (laughs) uh it would just be um be mindful of your future um you know, the largest majority of New Zealanders get to retirement dead or dead broke, unfortunately. So understand and get a, you get advice and understand where you need to be to, um, to, you know, not be so reliant on having to turn up to work every day. Um, get So just, you know, and then whatever the right journey is to get you there is the right journey to get you there. And, hey, we, we're pro-property because it's, you know, because in New Zealand, it's, it's just a, quite a microclimate for that being a good op, uh, opportunity for people. But it's, it's one part of an overall um, diversified portfolio. But I think, you know, the major thing just comes back to get advice. And hopefully, hopefully if anything, this has um, either kept the people who have joined this or are watching this to carry, to stay the course, um, or to, to reach out and get advice um, because um, we want to get as many people out of that majority that are <laughs> going to gonna have a pretty tough retirement um, into the minority who have actually gone and sought advice from from a good group of people. So that would be my my cool. closing comments. Nice. Um, hey, okay. We, I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. And um, thank you, everybody, uh, who's jumped, jumped, in, jumped in today, especially um, our, uh, our Rupert, Daniel, and Gareth. Thank you so much for your help. If anyone wants to know anything further, got any further questions that they want to ask, please just email us. Um, you can easily track us down at um, mortgagelab.co.nz. Um, I will pass on anything that comes through, or Rupert will, um, to, to Daniel or Gareth. And um, we're just here for anyone who needs assistance, so or help, or so. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you guys. See you later.